All right, let's jump straight into it. So in this audience, there are so many incredible entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that a lot of them would just love to hunt you down after mm -hmm. this talk. So which ones are you uh, looking for more specifically? Cool. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ella Made. Um, I'm one of the founding partners at 50 Years. It's a San Francisco-based early stage venture firm uh, funding uh, companies that are solving the world's biggest problems with technology. And we like, um, we like technologically um, heavy, um, novel, uh, scalable solutions to problems. So food tech, synthetic biology, robotics, space tech. Early stage to Series A, so if you can check all the boxes, then feel but, free to hunt and me any down. Like any special personality traits or any kinds of entrepreneurs that you're looking for? Or? Yeah, I mean, specifically, most of the teams we end up funding usually have um, very deep technical expertise on the team, often founders who have PhD um, in a certain technology area. We like, um, we like engineering mindset um, um, and people who really also uh, care about building a big business but also care about... Um, solving some big problem they see in the world and they think they can contribute. So the combination of, of the two is quite important. Vishal, Obvious? Yeah, so I am um, one of the co-founders of Obvious Ventures. Uh, Obvious is a San, San Francisco-based uh, venture firm. Uh, the roots of Obvious is, uh, is building companies like Twitter and Medium. Uh, four years ago, we started a venture fund with a belief that um, uh, you know, the most valuable and impactful companies of our times are going to be companies which are solving uh, humanity's biggest challenges. Uh, what we are looking for is uh, world positive entrepreneurs. We call them world positive entrepreneurs who are building disruptive solutions uh, to the biggest problems. Um, and we call this kind of activity world positive investing. Um, so that's what we do. We are looking for world positive entrepreneurs who are solving big problems, and we call those companies world positive companies, um, which is moving, th these companies are, are, are moving the world forward in, in positive ways. Um, our fund, uh, our first fund was $123 million. Our second fund was $191 million. Um, and, um, and we are focused, 80% of our focus is, uh, is uh, early stage and 20% we focus on growth companies. Mm. And, and has that strategy evolved over time at all, or has it been the same since the inception? Um, we uh, have not changed our investment thesis strategy or the stage focus mm. strategy, um, and we continue to kind of refine and, and, uh, and just work with, with the best uh, entrepreneurs. So, so strategy has remained the same. And, and in your case, so looking back at the first yeah, investment you yeah, did yeah. with the 50 and, and now? Yeah, I think ours um, has clarified a little bit. With, with our fund one, uh, when we started, uh, it, the fund was started by uh, entrepreneurs. Our experience was in mostly software-based um, uh, companies. And um, I think the theme clarified towards uh, deep tech and, and, sort, and harder things. Since, since that time, we built a, a community of mentors and uh, some uh, deep tech founders of successful companies that are uh, supporting our portfolio founders. What about you, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we at Norquin, we're looking for what we call impact unicorn. So companies that have the potential to uh, influence positively one billion people. Um, mm -hmm. But super difficult to find. Um, you need crazy entrepreneurs, uh, great business ideas, and uh, obviously some underlying impact in that business model as well. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, we found that the traditional world of impact has often been, they've been thinking too small. And yeah. we, when we're looking at the big world problems we're facing, we need a new generation of entrepreneurs, essentially. So we've, yeah, I mean, we, we're just a couple of months old. Yeah. But so our strategy hasn't changed that much. Right. No. Right. Cool. Right. And, and so, um, tell us a little bit about the companies you've invested in. What, what are they like? Is there any particular niche area or...? Yeah, so we're... Um, we have a pretty broad approach. We are um, uh, trying to keep uh, our eyes open and see uh, 
what technologies emerge that we should be paying attention to. So a lot, a lot of uh, we're more thesis uh, driven than uh, verticals driven in, in that way. Um, just a few examples. I'm sure all of you have uh, by now heard also because you know they were speaking here last last year at Slash, a company called Memphis Meats, um, uh, growing. Uh, real uh, clean meat outside of animals um, so that every meat eater can feel even better about the choice they make and, and so it's also better for the planet and for all sorts of reasons. So we're big investors in cellular agriculture in that whole uh, mm. uh, trend. We so far made four investments uh, in companies in that space, making more soon uh, uh, plant um, based uh, replacements and technologies in the plant-based foods, uh, which, which there's a big need for our big theme for us as well. Another company um, we funded um, is, um, is tackling digital inclusion. It's a, it's a small satellite company that's um, building telecommunication satellites, geostationary satellites that to connect 4 billion people who, believe it or not right now, uh, do not have any access to internet. So half of the world's uh, population is digitally excluded. So that, that was a very interesting um, company for us. And uh, we funded various approaches to creating clean chemicals, moving away from petrochemicals at, sc at scale. So enzymatic solutions, um, uh, solutions uh, using synthetic biology, um, we're very, uh, very uh, excited about unsexy industrial processes that needs to that needs to be changed uh, these days. Yeah. And yeah. what would you say, Vishal? Any yeah. any particular company you're especially proud of? Or? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So I think our thesis, like this whole idea of like solving biggest problems, what we've done is we've productized our investment thesis in three different buckets. Mm. Uh, bucket number one is uh, is reimagining resource-intensive industries. Uh, so as an example. We have invested in a company called Diamond Foundry, which is building gem quality diamonds in a lab. These are two, three, four carat diamonds where you don't need to go do mining. We have another company called Proterra, which is electrifying a bus and selling into the municipal market. Our only investment outside US is a European company called Lilium, which we invested along with Atomico, which is a VTOL business. Mm -hmm. um, going after uh, transportation. Um, we also have invested in computational biology space, uh, companies like Zymergen, uh, which, which is uh, helping design new microbes for industrial processes. So, so there's a lot of investments around this reimagining re resource uh, theme. The second bucket for us is health, uh, where we invest in future of food and future of health. Uh, in Future of Food, uh, one of the areas we've invested in is plant-based proteins. Uh, there is a company called Beyond Meat, which is a number one player in the US. Uh, we are an early investor in that company. Mm. Uh, future of uh, Health, uh, uh, we are uh, investors in actually a local, we've backed a local Finnish guy who is also an American Finnish uh, um, guy. His name is Sami Inkinen. Um, uh, he is building a company called Verta Health, which is reversing type 2 diabetes. Uh, which is a uh, which is a big global problem. Uh, mm -hmm. So health is is another area we invest in. One company we've invested in is Recursion Pharma, uh, which uh, which is a company using machine vision as a way to uh, match drug uh, molecules and rare diseases uh, through through use of technology. So that's our second bucket. Our third bucket is people power, where we focus on future of work, uh, future of money, and future of learning. Future of work, uh, we are an investor in a company called Gusto, uh, which is in the HR tech uh, uh, space, is one of the fastest growing companies in, in Valley. Um, future of uh, money, we are investors in a company called Long Term Stock Exchange, uh, which is building a new stock exchange ar around this whole idea of long term uh, investing and long term mm. institutional building. Mm. So that gives you a feel of what we look at. But, and all of these companies are pure commercial investments, right? There is no impact discount on how you operate. Not at all, I think. Yeah, no, I think our, our view is, uh, is actually opposite uh, from a discount perspective. I think our view is, if you look at last 100 years, uh, you know, plumbing got in, uh, invented and then you had air conditioning and, and all these kind of technologies 
Google search got invented, which improved human life. Uh, and, and, and so that's what we're looking for. What are the contemporary issues of our times which we can solve and move the world forward in positive ways? Uh, that's what gets us excited as a firm. Um, and, and Ella, you often talk about the change from the doc, uh, Milton Friedman doctrine into what? And tell us a little bit about yeah, that. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Into what? Into something that's starting to crystallize now, for sure. But it just coming to a real realization that the current perception of business has been, it's, it's just one of the versions of capitalism that we could have. And uh, pretty much the current uh, version has been defined in an op-ed written um, and published in the early 1970s, I think the 1971s by Friedman at the New York Times, where he is uh, talking about anybody who's uh, trying to ha have do positive things through business or even create employment or any focus on anything else than profit maximization. He, he talks, uh, to, he, he specifically uses the terms, those entrepreneurs are undermi undermining the basis of our free society. So this paranoid view of business that evolved, I think, maybe in um, contrast to, to uh, communism, uh, you know, in the Cold War, is what happens to be the system we have, which is insane. So um, we have some good thinkers. Nick Hanauer, who was actually at Slash last year, I think he's uh, contributing uh, importantly to the conversation. We are creating data points. We're trying to show, hey, I mean, we're, people are driven by different things. People are driven by what they're doing in the world, some by money, some by the name they're creating for themselves. We want to use those powers and show how to create a better world. And you know, as, as you are, how do we show by what we're doing that you can actually make this better returns and you can, you can uh, run uh, more exciting companies that are going to be, that are going to be more competitive in the long term. Um, Using this more inspiring version of business, which is you know why this why Slash's main theme this exactly. year is exactly that. The, the, yeah. Our entire point is there is there basically have been no clear role models in this industry, yeah. and, and that's the problem. Like if you, um, you do you know who Norman Borlaug is? So, so Norman, yeah, he should be the most <laughs> celebrated person in the history yeah. of mankind. So he's the, in 1943, he started experimenting in wheat in Mexico. He uh, is the man behind the Green Revolution, essentially. And he, he took that practice to Pakistan and then to India and then Africa. In 1970, he got Nobel Prize for Peace. Mm. Um, and he directly or indirectly saved one billion people from starvation. Mm -hmm. And no one knows who he is. Yeah, well, well, isn't that crazy? Yeah. So building role models in impact investing or not even impact investing, in general, people who actually solve fundamental yeah. problems. So after this panel, we're going to tweet his name. And Norman then Borlaug, exactly. Yeah. Bio, yeah. So Something that Finland can be proud yeah. of, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Love uh, I think I'll add to the Friedman doctrine. I think, I think the whole idea of uh, you know, maximizing profit, and that's the only role or purpose of an organization, is flawed because what has happened uh, since then is, I think, uh, uh, a lot of companies, because of public markets as well as uh, quarterly earnings, are only able to focus on what is very short term. Yeah. And human nature sometimes is also very short term oriented. Mm -hmm. So that combination creates not long term institutional building. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and what gets us excited and where I think there's a huge amount of opportunity is how do you incentivize long term yeah. uh, uh, institutional building, long term mm -hmm. thinking in organizations. Uh, and, 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 and fundamentally, that's the reason why we're very excited about our investment in, uh, in, a, in a new stock exchange. Yeah, uh, okay. because, because if you are able to align uh, companies' valuations, incentives for, uh, for the CEO, salaries and, and management salaries uh, and incentives uh, to a long-term thinking, that can better align the companies. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, well, how long is long-term in this case? I think long-term institutional uh, building has to be much more than a quarterly yeah. in, uh, investment. So you should be thinking about, like, hey, what you're doing this year, but mm. you're also thinking about, like, hey, mm. fifth year from now, how do you make investments today so that, like, you can reap benefits uh, in, in the future, right? So I love that you guys back the long-term st stock exchange, and I think Eric is doing an amazing thing. I think it's worth noting what the, like, kind of even more explaining what the problem is. So. In the current system that we have, it's, it's uh, in the cor current corporate law, it's actually um, um, 
doing anything else than maximizing shareholder value is uh, is against sort of the interest in the company. So if you have if you're in this circle of quarterly re report, reporting, what you've done, and and it's usually. Mm, it, you can get actually fired as a CEO, and, and if you're, or even if you're, let's say, polluting a local river, but within the limits of the, the law, or maybe in a way that you cannot be caught, and you're, as a CEO, you're deciding, no, I don't want to be polluting the local river because it sucks. Um, if your shareholders can prove that you were, you know, acting against maximizing uh, value, they can sue you and they can win the case. This is the current problem that we have with corporate law, which actually the whole system creates very perverse incentives. So we're at a little bit of earlier stage. That investment is going to help with public companies, uh, long-term stock exchange right. when, it, when it launches, but it's just so needed. And, and we need to really rethink the big business from the ground up because even if the current CEOs of really big companies want to do the right thing, it's not like they actually have much room uh, because of how, uh, right now, the system uh, works. Yeah, no, I think the, the, the thing is, uh, your example of pollution, like, yeah. I think if you are a, a CEO of a company and, and you are, uh, your incentives are like next quarter, if you hit certain targets and you make your bonus and you are happy and maybe you retire, uh, Versus, and, and then so you then pollute, right? Mm -hmm. But fifth year, the pollution becomes a big, huge problem and there's a lawsuit mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's a negative issue to the balance sheet of the company because of that lots, lawsuit. That only will get incorporated into the strategic thinking if you were thinking about long term. Yeah. And if the incentive structures were long term. Yeah. So I think that's the thing which, which uh, and great companies which have been built over 100 years uh, have always thought about long term. Yeah. Mm. You know, it's not, not a new concept. It's just I think we've become very short term oriented. So we're in, we share San Francisco. We're essentially, Obvious Ventures is where we work uh, closely. We, we're, we're friendly. How is... How is Europe? How is your, your, you guys are based in Stockholm, in right? In Stockholm. How? Yeah, I mean, we're thinking exactly the same. Our investment horizon is 20 years, yeah. uh, at least. Um, okay. Yeah, so, but, but I think what's interesting in, in one way, though, is like, I think that's great, but how can we use the, the current system, the current capitalistic mode that we have to mm -hmm. also do good? Yeah. How, what's your thinking around that? Or shouldn't we not even think around it that way and instead just accept the setup that we have? I think we're using the current sy capitalist system uh, right now pretty well, right? Would no, I think we believe uh, we believe in capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe in um, uh, the only thing we we don't like about capitalism is the short term uh, aspect of it. So, but mm -hmm. if you are able to kind of think long term, if you are able to solve big problems, improve life on the planet, mm -hmm. um, and and get rewarded as an entrepreneur, that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. And and so we want to kind of use the power of capitalism um, to to solve big problems and mm -hmm. and 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 make a huge amount of returns for our investors um, mm -hmm. in in the process. Uh, and. Uh, and, and, and that's our hope, because I think at least what I'm finding is uh, policy is becoming harder and harder, right? Like, so, uh, so, so that's our hope. Mm. So switching gear a little bit, when you look at um, the, the big problems that we're facing as a mm -hmm. cl climate change, mental il illness, certain diseases and so on, which uh, technologies are you most excited about right now? What is it that you like, you see something, you have to call your mother and tell them, or like, oh, I saw this, this is just going to change everything. <laughs> right. Uh, I think the two or three technologies which I'm really thinking about today, uh, one, one is uh, inspired by blockchain. Uh, I've been thinking about like, is there a way to create, um, instead of like reimagine corporate structure, mm -hmm. is there a way to kind of reimagine corporation mm -hmm. by having a network based economy? It's like think about open source uh, comes together with a coin-based economy, mm. uh, and, and, and so if you participate in this kind of economy, uh, that whoever is creating value also extracts value, right? A uh, lot, of, lot of business models which have been built around, um, uh, you know, where, where people add value, only corporations are able to kind of extract value and people don't, right? Like, so, so that's one area which I'm really interested in. Uh, second thing which I'm interested in, uh, is uh, is how can uh, you know AI, robotics, machine learning 
be able to be used in a way that makes humans superhumans? Like, how, how do you augment human beings? Like, I think there's a huge talk about replacement, which doesn't get me excited. I think mm. what gets me excited is like, hey, how, how can you improve potential mm. uh, of, of, uh, of human beings? Mm. Ella, is there? Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, um, I've been thinking about food tech a lot recently because uh, animal agriculture is such a huge contributor to uh, greenhouse gas em bigger than tra greenhouse gas emissions, actually bigger than uh, all sectors of transportation combined. Um, so um, cellular ag, which I mentioned before, is one of the solutions, but more immediate ones uh, is <coughs> growing mycelium uh, for protein and it can grow on waste and I, I think we're going to see many interesting companies started with that. How do you use that? What happens after you grow mycelium? Well, you extract the protein and then you use them as ingredients. But essentially, um, my, my, mycelium, so the, so the body, not the fruit, the fruit of the mushrooms is the, the, the mushrooms we know, the sort of the visible mushrooms, but myce mycelium um, is abundant in the world, is, uh, creates, uh, it, it can grow biomass extremely fast, can grow on anything, and it has a, a closer amino acid profile to that of uh, animals than to plants. So actually, it can, it can be a really good protein, rep can, it, can, it just has really good nutritional value for, for all, the re uh, all the reasons we want it in. Um, the pure proteins can be extracted um, and, and they can be flavorless, flavorless if needed. So it's a great material and it's, I think there's great promise there. I recently have been studying um, big industrial um, um, extruders and, and technologies uh, for food processing, which actually haven't changed since the 60s and 70s, which is quite remarkable. And we're going to see, I think, a few billion dollar companies in that space because it's not something that young entrepreneurs coming from academia currently think about but maybe more people actually who are digging deeper in what's broken in the food system are looking at all those unsexy elements that need to be changed for that system to be more efficient um yeah okay so uh, <laughs> what about you you want to know I, what i think um probably new ways of treating cancer is okay. incredible so we, yeah, we're yeah. seeing um and traditionally, cancer has been treated with radiation or chemo or surgery, and now you're yeah. seeing ways of treating cancer with immuno immunotherapy, yeah. which is super exciting, and you're basically using the mechanisms in the body to attack the cancer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think, I think health, health is going to get transformed in the next 15, 20 years. Yeah. Uh, if you think about genomics, you think about microbiome, uh, you think about sensor technology, you think about personalization, uh, and, and, and medicine will look very different uh, yeah. in, in the future. A great opportunity to innovate there. So, yeah. and like, to be a little bit provocative, you, you're both trying to improve the world as much as possible, and, but you're based in San Francisco and you've only invested in US-based companies. You had one outside of the US. Mm -hmm. uh, and you we have two in Canada and some, uh, one in Cambridge. Okay, uh, but okay, for now. shouldn't there be more possibility to make impact or a positive contribution to the world if you find companies yeah. in regions that need it more? Or is that something you think about at all? Yeah, I think, yes, th that's absolutely the case. I think it's also quite important to, to try to do a good job and, and scope your work somehow. And I think that's, we as a small organization, um, people-wise, um, needed a good place to start. And, and I think even building out a network in Silicon Valley, even if you want to expand to Europe, expand to Asia, it's a really damn good place to start because then many companies will end up on the fundraising circuit uh, mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley. So it's really good to be rooted there. And I actually was a partner, um, after I run a software business before, but then I was a partner at a software-focused fund in Europe before, and that's a very common theme of companies from Europe also wanting to go to, so to, the, to the US. So the temptation is always there, I think. Um, we keep learning and we're expanding the team, and it's always, um, there's always a balance. I think we're really trying to keep the quality of what we're doing high, and it's just mm. difficult to do everything at once. But if, it, hopefully there's just going to be more funds like that in Europe as well. That's, we definitely need more players in, in the ecosystem. Yeah, no, I think uh, I, I tell this to my entrepreneurs, like you have to walk before you run. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and so for us, uh, we, we've started in the US. Uh, we have fine-tuned our investment strategy. 
been very lucky uh, that uh, that we've been able to back am some amazing companies uh, which are building transformative uh, you know businesses and I have been scaling really rapidly and 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 so uh, just proving that in, in in that market we made one investment outside uh, us um, but hopefully in future we'll will be more open to kind of going outside yeah. uh, us as well i think for us we, our, our motto is more no guts no glory so we we've been around now for a few months in stockholm but the plan is to open up in 25 more countries yeah. the oh, same wow. yeah. 25 more 25 countries. yeah so we're looking at six more now so, you know nothing no change came out of normal wow. so, so we're trying yeah. to do something different wow, yeah. yeah i mean that's that mm. would be an interesting uh, investment committee we're probably going to fail but uh, <laughs> no, we're going to we're going to try at least it's yeah. Bo bold ideas are, are always exactly. uh, which changes the world. So, yeah, that's <laughs> so just uh, one final word then. What are you most optimistic about right now in the world? You know, I, I think like this is a little a long winded answer. Like from a technology perspective, you know, if you think about uh, history of technology, I think you, you had uh, a personal computer which created Microsoft. Uh, you had multiple computers got connected, internet happened, mm. created Google. Um, you were able to miniaturize the computer and put it a computer into your pocket and mm. Facebook happened uh, and and now I think where we are is every every person has a supercomputer or will have supercomputer uh, the, everything is going to get connected mm. um, objects will ha have uh, have sensors uh, and and there is a rise of uh, exponential uh, technologies which are all converging like whether it's drone and AI and, mm. uh, and and sensor technology so there's a huge opportunity for taking what we have here to reimagine every industry in a way that it's good from an environment perspective mm. it's good from uh, human health perspective it's good from like human potential perspective so that's yeah. kind of the opportunity which we are excited about cool Ella I think I'm genuinely extremely excited about the changing narrative of business. I think part of what we're trying to do in 50 years is to contribute um, to that transition. And that transition needs data. So I remember I have started my first soft, it was a software development firm in 2006, so 11 years ago. Um, and, the, and, and then was involved in different companies. But the, initially, people were talking about startups just in... Um, just in the sort of, you know, startups were software, mm. right? And I think there's been so much know-how, you know, through the Lean Startup methodology and through conferences like Slush um, and through everyone who's been working in this industry. It's so much know-how developed. And I think it's amazing to see that that knowledge and that approach to run, it's just to, a, to running companies, to experimentation, to trying and getting back on your feet, it's spilling out to, Diagnostics, energy, like nu there are nuclear energy startups uh, mm. that are, you know, considering themselves startups and then would co come to those conferences and, and, and learn. Obviously, not all the knowledge is transferable, but just to see that there's this big wave of entrepreneurship. Um, and then. And We're then, super yeah. out of time now. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I okay. wanted to end on this optimistic okay. note. Yeah, so please, thank you so yeah. much, guys. Okay. And uh, thank you for listening. Th thank okay. you. Thank you. Sorry for. <laughs> taking longer. <laughs>